So I did a memoir that was hard and terrifying. So I've um, moved away from that for the moment, right away. Um, and I figured there were some things. Reality, reality is hard to write about. So um, this, this doesn't have a title, um, but I have a Gmail printout of a couple of people I sent it to. And the Gmail title is, um, I wrote something horrible, look. So, um, <laughs> so because it's October and it's spooky, I guess. Um, uh, this is a little something in that um, in that realm. Molly stares out the bathroom window at the girls in the garden next door. Long, soft figures in the sun. They're older than she is. Her own body still uneventful as a Tuesday morning. Still flat. Still bony. She wonders. Will she ever be as beautiful as they are? Will she ever meet girls like them? Molly leans on the windowsill. She is sure she knows what love is. Sure that it is the yellow day on Shannon next door's hair. She is sure that it is her freckled shoulders. Molly is sure. But she won't find the word love in her mouth for years to come. It will be Natalie, she says it to, and Natalie will not say it back, but will kiss her regardless. Molly's braces are still new, and she runs her tongue over them and winces, same as always. She hates them. Kieran sometimes laughs at her new lisp, and she hates that too, his laughter so cruel lately, something new in him. She tells him every time that she'd rather have braces than spots, all cackling come back at the fresh acne dappled across her brother's once clear skin. They look so alike until recently. Only lately stopped murmuring their coded twin speak to one another. She is taller than he is now. She is sure this has something to do with it. Their mother had warned them that things this year would be different. They wouldn't be as close, she said, brushing Molly's hair in the evening. You have to be patient with them, she said. You two won't grow up at the same rate or in the same ways. They'll be wanting to spend more time alone. <laughs> the slight 12-year-old girl understood this, the soft hairbrush sounding like a whispering ocean against her head, her wild curls tamed at the tender hands of her mother. This spring it had started. Molly hadn't quite managed to put her finger on it, the disinterest that had fallen upon her. Her ponies had been stacked in their plastic stables for months. Her dolls had not gone to the nightclub or the palace or for any picnics lately. She'd been playing with stickers, sure, because stickers were cool, but she'd been using her markers not really to draw things, but to write things. They were the only items left that she'd really brought with her to this new year. They were also the only things that she had brought with her to Great Aunt Rita's house. Great Aunt Rita was a ballet dancer in her youth and is presently a lady about town. This means that she usually leaves Molly and Kieran alone from the morning until just before dinner when she comes home and boils them a heap of pasta in shapes Molly never usually gets in her house, little bows and spirals. Sometimes they're even orange or green, as well as just white. Great Aunt Rita sits and eats water crackers and drinks a cup of strong, milkless tea. Kieran and Molly heap grated sharp cheese onto their mountains of tendrils and tubes. Molly can smell the drink off her. Kieran can too. When they turned in the first night, Kieran and Molly arrived. Kieran whispered across the guest room to his sister, did she think Great Aunt Rita was a drunk? And Molly said, for sure, yeah. And they laughed a little. Molly is sure that they have not laughed since then. It has been awfully quiet. Great Aunt Rita got her some bright purple mascara in the chemist's yesterday. It made her green eyes huge, and she'd sit in the bathroom, then dragging a tiny brush along her eyelashes, staring at herself in the mirror, edging herself towards transformation. Molly is clutching the purple tube in her hand, staring out from under her lashes, out the open window at the girls next door, her pulse beating through her body. Love, this is love. The light almost falls like amethyst through her new gaze. She feels like this might be the beginning of becoming beautiful. Hello. She knows that this will be a long fortnight, waiting for her and Kieran's parents to get back. It has been a nice couple of days so far, but the wait was already starting to sprawl out ahead of her. Sometimes anticipation of being bored is almost worse than the feeling of boredom itself. 
Molly knows that if this had been last year, her and Kieran would be colouring in or playing Lego or making a fort or something or anything. Now, now she doesn't even have any idea where he is. She considers for a minute inviting him to peer out at Shannon next door and her friends, but she thinks maybe that might be weird. She tells him everything, usually. Kieran knows what she is most afraid of, and she knows all of his fears too. When his night terrors walked him all over their parents' house a few years before, Molly would trail after the sleeping ghost of her brother to make sure that he didn't fall down the stairs or climb out any windows. In the morning before school, he'd tell her about what happened in his sleep, the rushing steel things that felt like trains but looked like cats, the spiders that turned his body to chalk. She'd hug him with her arms around his shoulders like a clamp as Kieran sobbed it out, snot and horror, and I don't know why it is like this, and she'd tell him that if she could take it off him, she would, she would, she would. They know one another like this, what the inside of one another's minds looks like. When a single hair appeared under Molly's armpit earlier that year, she lauded it over him like a tiny trophy, rather than some <laughs> bod strange bodily shame. It was still there, just the one. She loved it. Kieran had howled with jealousy, how he longed for a beard. Molly said that he would never have a beard. And they laughed and screamed and told their, and their mother told them to stop, stop, get ready for school. They tell each other everything, don't they? So why shouldn't she invite him to look at Shannon next door? Now that she thinks of it, Molly doesn't feel like that's weird at all. But she still doesn't know where he is. He's not in the garden. It's just a couple of chickens great Aunt Rita keeps pecking around in their run. Molly hops down from her perch and gives a final glance in the mirror. Her eyelashes are five yards of purple ribbon. Her eyes are emerald hearts singing Shannon next door, Shannon next door in the sunlight. She thinks that later she will write her name a thousand times in her notebook. She will write it in all the colors she has in her markers box, Shannon, Shannon, Shannon. And she will put stickers all around this and alter to the glowing late summer miracle of the body of her next door neighbor. Kieran! Molly shouts, stepping from the bathroom into the long landing of Griff of Great Aunt Rita's home. It half echoes, hitting the texture of the old wallpaper, the unusual height of the ceiling. This house was not like her house, her pokey house attached to a row of other pokey houses in the almost din of the city. This house was like her house, stretched taller, grander, only attached to one other house, Shannon's house. All around them was other houses, then the forest, and then the motorway, and then the forest again. Kieran, she shouts again. It carries further, but no reply comes. She potters down the stairs, hollering his name in silly voices, laughing over syllables, thinking, why is he hiding? What is he even up to? Kieran, she pulls out the eyes of his name. Kieran, she draws out the A's long, almost musical. Nothing. Great Aunt Rita's house is all textured pink wallpaper, all dense carpet. Large glass bowls of deeply scented dried flowers are on every small table. There are seven small tables. <laughs> Molly and Kieran were told explicitly not to touch them or eat them. There are 35 globes in varying shapes, sizes, and colors. There are 44 statues of Holy Mary, sheathed in her blue veil, pious and eternally virgin, her feet a bed of roses. Molly and Kieran are not allowed to touch any of the globes or any of the Marys. Molly is always tempted, like a tiny vengeance, to run her hands down the side of one of the Mary's white, noble faces, just to see what would happen. <laughs> Nothing would happen. <laughs> Nothing ever happens. The house is a museum of tiny statues, all dust and silence, and Molly's footsteps fall on the carpet of the, the, Kieran! Kieran! She pads through the lino of the austere kitchen, tiles and floor yellow, too yellow. She opens the fridge and inhales the cold. You're not in here, Kieran, she murmurs. She removes a single slice of orange cheddar from a packet, folds it into four and pops it in her mouth. This is the kind of thing her mother would go through her for, picking food out of the fridge and eating it there in the cold, thrumming globe. But great Aunt Rita wouldn't even notice. Holy Mary statues and globes and potpourri, she would notice, but nothing from the fridge. Great Aunt Rita, to the best of Molly's knowledge, only eats water crackers. Kieran is not in the floral living room or in the too hot conservatory with wicker chairs and photo albums on a shelf. 
Kieran is now under the stairs where all the dusty bottles of beer for Christmas are stored. He's not downstairs at all, Molly realizes the silence of the ground floor of Great Aunt Rita's house suddenly becoming unpleasant rather than comforting. Her footfalls are louder now, they carry further. She wonders if he can hear her and why he isn't replying. Molly ascends to the top floor of the house with more caution now, each step ex uh, exhaling their creak, a note minor now, rather than the clattering major scale they were when she first thundered down them, singing Kieran's name, expecting to find her brother hunched over a book or flapping his back in front of the old television. Something in the air feels thick now, like when it's just about to rain, but the sky hasn't broken yet. The thickness is on Molly's skin, and it makes the fine white hairs on her pale arms stand. The thickness of it is more than her love for Shannon next door now. She whispers her brother's name as she reaches the landing. Kira? His name is a question in her mouth now, her breath caught somewhere behind her teeth, somewhere in the dark of the back of her throat. She steps along the corridor which sprawls ahead of her, longer now than it was, lit with stripes of shade and bright from the Venetian blinds. The Holy Mary on the hall table with dried flowers at her feet averts her gaze from Molly as she creeps past. Kieran is not in their bedroom. Their single beds on opposite side of the room, unmade. Hers, his sister kneels down and checks under them both. And she squats down and can feel her heart become huge, menacing, beating too loud. There is nothing under each bed but the empty space of a room almost exclusively unlived in for the other 50 weeks of the year. Maybe you went around the shop, Molly whispers, pulling herself off the floor, her voice soft. Maybe you went for a walk around the block or a run up to the cul-de-sac. She knows he has not left the house. The front doors lock and latch announce themselves with volume if you so much as look at them. When Molly steps back into the corridor, she takes stock of the other two doors her brother may be behind. He's either in the hot press, a slim closet jammed with towels and neatly folded bed sheets that otherwise only houses the boiler for the house, or in Great Aunt Rita's room. Suddenly, laughing at her own paranoia, her own terror. She swings the door open of the hot press and scans her eyes up and down the neat shelves of pressed linen. You hiding in here between a couple of tablecloths? She laughs too loud, too shrill. She slams the hot press door shut, panic coloring, coloring her hysterical cackling. Come out! Kieran! Kieran! Molly is a tiny storm now as she stomps into Great Aunt Rita's room, the carpet lush here, her armoire, a tower of delicate bottles and brushes, her bed enormous and quilted and made just so, her writing desk neat, too neat, everything is lavender and mint, and Molly wants to upset all of it. She wants to smash the mirror and knock the bottles and set fire to the bed and rip up the carpet. Kieran is not here. And she screams, ragged in frustration. She crumples onto the carpet. How did it get like this? How the brother she came into the world half of, the tiny boy she shared home in her mother's belly with, the boy who understood everything. How is it that he is hiding from her when he knows, he knows that she needs him? They feel the same things. They are made of the same things. And in all of this house, she can't see him, feel him, or, or hear over the sound of her own heart and breath, her face less than an inch from the carpet. She suddenly hears it, a low note on repeat. It was unsurprising in that moment, like she'd been unable to hear it all along over the sound of her own silly panic, silly. A smile cracks over her face and she holds that moment close before standing up and turning to the slim white door to Great Aunt Rita's wardrobe. Molly's hand turns the glass knob on the door and swings open the wardrobe, like how obvious. Like hasn't it been calling her all along and wasn't the sound of herself too loud to hear him, to hear the throng singing, Kieran, Kieran. And there is her sweet brother, lying in prayer on the floor of the wardrobe, low and flat and humble before there on the wall like a fist of sunlight or something more terrible than sunlight. There is the eye, lashes like sharp teeth and an iris that goes far beyond the wall, far beyond Shannon next door, far out past the woods and the motorway and the woods again. It is beautiful. Here on, it says, it blinks. Molly closes the door behind her with a click. Here on. 
She falls to her knees beside her brother, and his breath is soft and peaceful. Kiron, the eye says, blinking. Kiron, it says, so tender. Molly, Molly, 